So I'm really pleased to have been joined by uh, General Juan Ayala and uh, Rear Admiral David Titley of the uh, US Navy. Uh, Rear Admiral Titley, you're the oceanographer of the US Navy and also the director of the US Navy's uh, climate change uh, kind of area. How do I how do I put that into into an official title? Yeah, yes, that's that's actually uh, perfect. I I run the task force on the Navy's climate change. Actually, I don't really run it. I, what I like to say is I have two people who work for me, uh -huh. but about 450 people over 125 organizations in about eight different countries who work with us mm -hmm. on task force climate change and it's not kind of the average uh, stereotypical attendee of a, of a climate conference to see uh, two uh, military figures uh, with their with badges and, uh, a marine. and a marine yeah why, why is the navy worried about climate change well it's it's a great question and we're what first we're very very happy uh, to be here as part of the United States delegation uh, because we can get the message out that climate change is amongst other things, a very, very critical national security issue. Uh, I'll, I'll just speak from the Navy perspective, but when you take a look at the changes that are happening in the Arctic right now, the opening of what our Chief of Naval Operations calls the Fifth Ocean, that has huge changes on world trade, it has changes on resources, fishing, hydrocarbon extraction, tourism, uh, that all brings national security implications. Sea level rise will create not only massive infrastructure challenges, but the potential for migration, saltwater intrusion, changing agriculture. And then I'll just finally talk about ocean acidification. Uh, as the carbon dioxide through a chemical reaction causes the ocean to become slightly more acidic, uh, that changes the whole potential for how the ecosystems interact in the ocean. Why do we care? Well, about a billion people get their protein from the ocean. If they cannot get that protein from the ocean, that we believe will be a tremendous accelerant to instability, which in turn will cause uh, basically bad things to happen. And is this something that we're seeing now and that people are worrying about now? Or are you planning for the future? Well, we're always planning for the future. Uh, I work at the United States Southern Command, mm -hmm. and we partner with approximately 31 nations in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. in uh, Central America, and uh, South America. And as the Admiral stated, instability is a big issue because instability crosses borders. Mm -hmm. Climate change can cause food scarcity, uh, food insecurity. Uh, it can cause demographics to change, population uh, pressures uh, on countries that are, uh, it can, that are not as developed. And so in order for us to mitigate this, we at Southern Command uh, reach out and try to partner with militaries on preparing them in advance for this. Disaster relief, whether it's a natural disaster or one caused eventually by climate change. Uh, and we're always reaching out within our own government, our Department of State, Department of Energy, within our own federal U.S. government, to reach out as a whole of government mm -hmm. to uh, our partner nations in order to mitigate uh, the changes in climate. Because a lot of the changes are not good, as the Admiral was stating. Mm -hmm. And so they affect stability. And stability eventually affects the well-being of, of, of all of us mm -hmm. uh, in, in this hemisphere and around the world. But this is a hugely divisive issue still, isn't it? Especially in American politics, you know, whether people believe in climate change, whether it's actually happening, whether it's man-made. Why isn't the Navy kind of having this debate internally? Why is the Navy just you know, getting on with it? Well, uh, there, there's a couple reasons. And, and anybody who's sort of ever been in a hierarchical organization, whether it's uh, military or, or civilian, mm -hmm. kind of understands that, you know, if your boss is interested, you're fascinated, at least if you want to keep your job. So leadership starts at the top, is what I'm really trying to say. And I can tell you that really starting from our president through our secretary of defense, and you can read his words in the, uh, in the quadrennial defense review, it sounds like a bureaucratic document, but really what it is, is it lays out the foundation for the way ahead for our Department of Defense for the next four years. And in it, for the first time, it talks about how important climate change is to national security. So then you come on down to the senior admiral in the United States Navy, Admiral Gary Ruffhead. Uh, he frankly hired me to do this job to look at climate change. And our Secretary of the Navy has really shown tremendous leadership by, amongst other things, looking at how can the United States Na the Naval Service, which is the Navy and the Marine Corps, reduce its carbon footprint by 55-0% by the year 2020. And that is relative to a baseline from the early 2000s. So leadership starts at the top, so that's one way. The other way when I talk to people is I say, just look at the facts. 
Don't worry about projections. Don't worry about the IPCC. Let's just look at the facts. And, and in the military, we're trained to look at the world as it is, not maybe as we wish it was, but just what are the facts. And the facts show the ice is melting, the glaciers are melting, the ocean is acidifying, the oceans are warming, the atmosphere is warming, precipitation is changing, storms are becoming stronger. Uh, all of those, if, if there was just one of those happening and none of the others, there'd probably be a lot of plausible explanations. But when you look at all of those changes, it just comes down to pretty simple physics, uh, that nobody has a better explanation than human-caused global warming for these changes. So that's kind of where I start. A and, and if people want to listen, uh, that, that tends to be a reasonable argument to start a discussion with. And the, the, the kind of worst case scenarios of climate change and, and indeed uh, the current trajectory that we're on for warming if, if these negotiations don't succeed is kind of four to five degrees and, and, and scientists suggest that there's real major consequences to that. Is the Army making contingency plans, the Navy making contingency, contingency plans, is this something that kind of is a real concern? What, what level of threat are you, are you talking about here? Well, uh, I, I will tell and I, and I echo the Admiral's words, I mean we're going to follow our, our civilian leadership. And I will tell you that even at the tactical level, mm -hmm. which is combat operations, uh, when we deployed the former commandant of our Marine Corps, uh, before there was a major deployment of our Marines into Afghanistan, uh, he was very emphatic and very specific that he wanted to reduce the energy footprint mm -hmm. of that deployment. And once we were on the ground, that he wanted to ensure that we had a reduced footprint mm -hmm. uh, t for fuel, for all kinds of energy that are associated with the deployment of, of people of that magnitude, of that size, and all the equipment. So uh, I think that we are very proactive. Mm -hmm. I think that we are very energetic in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this endeavor. Mm -hmm. And I think we're very serious. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it should not be any surprise to the public mm -hmm. that uh, you know, we take this seriously and we, again, we do, uh, uh, and we're moving forward. We're, we're not gonna stop. And, and is this all about climate change? Because actually, lots of the, the kind of the consequences or lots of the decisions that you'll be making as a result of, of your concerns about climate change presumably make a lot of sense uh, with regards to other national security concerns. So whether that's energy independence or whether that's uh, uh, kind of, uh, not relying on specific other countries for the, your sources of energy. Uh, it, are, there, are there broader benefits to the, the kind of changes that you're making? Absolutely. You've touched on something very, very important. And the main reason the United States Navy and Department of Navy are looking at the energy uh, kinds of uh, energy efficiency is just as the general said, it's, it is to improve our combat readiness. It, it increases our tactical flexibility at that unit level. It also reduces our strategic vulnerability at a, at a national level. And oh, by the way, it happens to reduce our greenhouse gases. So it is a tremendous co-benefit, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, in broader terms, if you just look at infrastructure, if you build for resilience and rather building for one very specific future, mm -hmm. no matter how exactly the science plays out, even down at the regional and local level, which we don't know very well at those fine levels, but that's okay. We know enough at the big picture to know that we got to get ready for changes. Mm -hmm. So you build for resilience. So this, this helps us. And one of the things we're doing is working very closely with the National Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, our Department of Energy, our NASA, our National Science Foundation, is how do we build the 21st century set of predictive capabilities or forecasts that are going to, not only for today and tomorrow and the next day, but like for five years, 10 years, 15 years, give planners the kind of information they really need. We know, we know the weather today, tomorrow, for a week, and we're pretty confident of our global predictions of climate change for 50 years, 30 years out, 60 years. What about in between? Because if you ever have to build a budget and put real money or resources, you care about that sort of that in-between time. So we are going to use, as, as the general said, a whole of government approach, not just Department of Defense, but a whole of government approach to really try to tackle that. And we think that will also help to move the conversation along in a very constructive manner. Let me uh, just add on to that. Uh, we're, not, we're never the lead in the Department of Defense, mm -hmm. but we support all the agencies that the Admiral spoke about. And the other thing we do, uh, especially the f combatant commands, the five mm -hmm. co geographical combatant commands, is we partner with other nations mm -hmm. so they can see, so they can mitigate the effects of climate change like we're doing. Mm -hmm. This is a global issue. Mm -hmm. It's not just the United States. So we partner with them 
we exchange information, uh, we try to be as interoperable with them and as transparent mm -hmm. so that they can also take that, especially military to military, which is what we can affect the best uh, in order for, to move this forward. And is, is there a limit to what you can achieve? Because let's face it, war is never going to be environmentally friendly, is it? Uh, like, there's, only, there's only so much that you can make a, 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 a huge uh, a military operation environmentally friendly. 50% 50, 50 emissions cuts by 2020, did you say? Seems like a, a, a massively ambitious target. But how, how, how much scope do you think there is for, for kind of pushing this agenda further? Well, I mean, there's always, you know, the, the what you want to do and what you can do. Uh, and, but, but something that I've seen, and I'll bet the general seen too, is you kind of get what you expect. Mm -hmm. So if you set your expectations low, guess what? Mm -hmm. That's what you get. If you set your expectations high, you might not get everything, but you'll get a whole lot more than if you set them low. So I think we have leadership today at the senior military and the senior civilian level that understand that, and they have set high expectations. And they are going to work very, very hard so that we can achieve absolutely as much of that as we, as we possibly can. And is it, is it your feeling that this is uh, very closely linked to the civilian kind of leadership in, in the US? Is this something that's going to be a passing phase perhaps when, when the, the next civilian leadership comes in? Or, or do you think now that this, the, the security threats are, are so kind of firmly recognized at a military level that actually it's coming, it's coming from the bottom as well? Sure. I, I, I also like the general to comment on this, but but just uh, one of our guiding documents in the Navy, and this is really signed by the uh, the senior uh, Navy guy, who's Admiral Ruffhead. It was signed at the time by the Commandant of the Marine Corps and the Commandant of the Coast Guard. So it's really the United States Naval Services in October of 2007, which is what 15 months before President Obama took office specifically said that climate change was one of the drivers of the 21st century. That predated this administration, so I believe that the Department of Defense recognized this, and, and of course, uh, you know, the, the role of the administration, because we serve our, our civilian leadership, that will always be an influence, but, but I get back to, we have to look at the facts on the ground, and the facts on the ground is the climate's changing. Is that a sentiment you'd echo? Yeah, exactly. And I don't think it's a passing phase. And I'll tell you, the strategic guidance that we get, and mm -hmm. I'll talk to you from my mm -hmm. uh, neck of the woods, which is a combatant command, mm -hmm. which is the, our area of responsibility, our area of focus, which is Latin America, Central America, mm -hmm. uh, and the Caribbean, is that our strategic guidance, in order for us to meet it, our strategic directives, is called a theater uh, campaign plan. Mm -hmm. We have certain objectives that are mandatory that we must meet. Mm -hmm. One of those, and this is a permanent document that's mm -hmm. changed every so often, but it's it, it's really very flexible, was climate change. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at climate change, I don't think it's a passing phase, and I think I agree with the Admiral. It's, uh, it's the facts are the facts. We're gonna have to look, you know, the, the sea is rising, the, the polar caps are melting, uh, the literals, which is where most of the world's population lives, is beginning to get flooded. They're going to have to move mm -hmm. eventually, and all this might cause instability. So we might uh, turn a blind eye to it, but the facts are the facts, and I think we're going to have to deal with them. The facts are the facts, and we're going to have to deal with them. Maybe that's an apt note to leave it with. Uh, thank you very much both for joining me. It's been a fascinating discussion. Well, well thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.